This is Midmorning on Minnesota Public Radio. I'm Carrie Miller. This hour, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Mr. Dawkins had a bestseller on his hands in 2006 within weeks of the publication of The God Delusion. But for all of the fame and fortune that the book brought him, it doesn't seem to have inspired legions of the once faithful to cast the scales from their eyes and join him in his atheism. He did, after all, hope to convert readers, writing in his preface, If this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. What presumptuous optimism, he added. Today we're going to talk about why, while atheism is growing, so is religious fundamentalism around the world. We'll tackle the critique that Richard Dawkins is himself a fundamentalist. And in this anniversary year of the publication of Charles Darwin's Origins, why Dawkins believes that the gaps in evolution don't argue for some kind of higher power designer. Richard Dawkins has recently retired from a professorship at the University of Oxford. He's the author of a number of books, including The Selfish Gene and The God Delusion. His new book, due out in the fall, is titled The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. He speaks tonight at the University of Minnesota at Northrop at 7 o'clock, but he joins me in the studio, and it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. It's interesting that you didn't think it was enough to write the book, make your cogent arguments, hope that it was persuasive to some people in The God Delusion, but that you really hoped that you would convert a lot of people into atheism. What happened? Well, I did use the phrase presumptuous optimism, which you you quoted. Uh, I never really thought it would have that effect. That was the ideal. What I hoped and what I think did happen is that people who were kind of sitting on the fence were emboldened, not only by my book, but by those of Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, Mm -hmm. Victor Stenger and others, to come out and speak their mind, where for so long they had been inhibited from doing so. Inhibited why? Because in the United States, at least large parts of of the United States, to be an atheist is uh, not quite as bad as to being a raving pedophile, but but there is a kind of extraordinary misconception about what an atheist is, and therefore somebody who actually is an atheist and has been for a very long time feels reluctant to say so. Tell me why you feel the need to convert that, that it isn't enough to put the argument out there. Uh, I, I don't know why you say I don't feel it's enough. I mean, I, that's what I do. I put the, you're, you're basing that on the one set sentence in the preface, are you? Well, I, well yes, I mean, yes. because and it's a very strong statement. You're yes. saying in the preface of The God Delusion, yes. I hope believers who read this yes. put this down and find themselves that they're atheists yeah. well, after they finish what it. What I was really doing was putting, putting the argument out there. Um, in the preface, I was stating my wildest dreams hope. I, mean, I, I didn't really think it was, uh, it was re- realistic. But I think I genuinely hadn't realized the extent to which there are people in the closet waiting to be called out, as it were. And I think that really has been a very uh, significant effect, something that I had not anticipated. When you talk about these people who are on the fence, do you picture them as people who maybe grew up in some kind of religious tradition. Many of them, because many people in this country did grow up in some kind of a religious tradition. But I think many of them, too, are people who actually are too busy to think about that kind of thing and haven't really thought to themselves, what do I really believe? They'd vaguely carried on with the childhood belief that they had, whatever kind of religion it was, whether um, Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or whatever it was, and just hadn't given it very much thought. And one of my hopes, and I think that's realized too, is that people will be inspired to think for themselves and decide what they really think, rather than just automatically say, oh, I'm Episcopalian or I'm Lutheran or I'm Catholic. Um, Think, no, wait a minute, am I? What do I actually think about this? And I hope that my book has done that. I guess I, I again come back, though, to this original question, is why does that matter to you that your showing people the way to atheism. The truth matters. Um, the, the, the truth about life, about the universe, about the cosmos, uh, about existence, these are fascinating facts. And it's such a tragedy if people are, go through their whole lives believing a falsehood simply because they were taught it in childhood. You said recently in an interview, I do think there's something Philistine about saying it doesn't matter what's true as long as you enjoy yourself, 
I really think that it matters what's true. F- broaden that out a exactly. little bit. I mean, that, that's just what I was trying to say. I think it matters what's true because the truth is beautiful, it's exciting, it's inspiring. Uh, there's almost nothing I can imagine more worthwhile to spending your life doing than understanding the truth of why you have a life at all in the first place. There will be people who who are faithful, who are believers, who say there is nothing beautiful about the idea that the truth may be that there is no higher power. W- uh, what's beautiful about that? Well, there's a kind of stark cold beauty about it. I, I agree with you that it might not be as consoling as a belief that you've got an imaginary friend who looks after you and, and knows what you're doing and guides your every step. That, I agree, might be consoling, but if it's false, it seems to me a rather ignoble way to gain consolation through, it, through your life. You know, your description of God as an imaginary friend who looks after you and guides your every move, I mean, there's a lot of different perceptions of what God is. Why do you choose that one? Well, because you raised the point about uh, comfort and consolation and the sort of warmth. No, those are the get. words you use. Yeah, um, I was c- coming back to that. Um, what other kinds of descriptions of God are you thinking of other than an imaginary friend who looks like I think you? there are people who believe that there is a higher power who put things in motion and isn't necessarily an imaginary friend who guides your every okay. move. Okay, well, a higher power who put things in, in, in motion in the first place, that... Um, impinges very directly on the scientific worldview, which is my, has been my whole professional life. So my whole professional life has been in understanding the universe, understanding life, about how the way things are has come about through the unaided laws of physics and chemistry. And that, to me, is a very exciting thought. It also happens to be true, in my view. Uh, and so if that's your conception of God, then it's one that I'm equally prepared to argue against, whether or not I use the, the phrase imaginary friend. Mm-hmm. I use the phrase imaginary friend because the question of comfort and consolation had come up. I guess I'm, I'm asking you, do you think it's more useful for your purposes of argument to use descriptions like that? Because in some ways they sound rather infantile and unsophisticated. Uh, yes, infantile and unsophisticated sums up. Uh, a majority of people's religious belief, in my view. Why? <laughs> Imaginary friend. I mean, you're, but, but I'm you're... saying that's the description you choose. That's not necessarily the description that all well, kinds of believers would apply. Wear it, I mean, there, I, I think that, that there, there'll be many people listening for whom that exactly fits. There may be others for whom it doesn't. But an enormous number of people pray every day for something that they want. They believe that God is guiding them, is looking after them, is going to look after them after they're dead. And they get enormous comfort from this. And so that's the sense in which I use the phrase imaginary friend. There'll be other people who say, don't care about that. What I care about is that God started the universe off, um, uh, planted life in it, is responsible for creation. Well, then I don't use the phrase imaginary friend for that. I, I'm, I'm then put on my scientist's hat and argue with them about evolution and things like that. And would you still say, though, that description of God the the higher power that put things in motion and doesn't guide our every move is also infantile and unsophisticated? I wouldn't say it's infantile. I think it's unsophisticated because it, it very often rests upon ignorance of the scientific explanations that we now have. I want to ask you about about someone like um, John Polkinghorne, the, the physicist, the intellectual. I think you two have crossed paths yes. in uh, in some places over the course of your career. I mean, he basically says that that what we know now tells us that there is no hard and fast truth, either in parts of science theory and in theology, that right now we don't have enough knowledge to know what is the truth, as you proclaim it, about theology. I agree with that. Um, John Polkinghorne is a very distinguished Uh, physicist, quantum physicist. He's also a Church of England vicar. Now, it's one thing to say there's a lot that we don't understand, and there certainly is a lot that we don't understand, and when we do understand it, it's going to be very wonderful. And I could imagine uh, a good case being made for a kind of deistic God, a sort of um, fundamental intelligence that started the universe off, that laid down the laws of physics. Wait, you you can imagine an argument for that? Are you I saying can imagine, you would I can believe imagine that? an argument for that. And, you... and, and um, what I'm going on to say is that that I could respect, I and mean, that I could have a, have a, a 